everyone hear me okay? Okay, good. All right. Um, my slides up there? There we go. Okay. So um, this talk is all about how to take all that wonderful Python 2 code you've been writing all the, for all these years and trying to make it so you can run it in all these Python 2 and 3 with the hope that your dependencies will someday allow you to actually run 3 fully and you can enjoy the bliss that is Python 3 that you hear about in these mythical hallway talks. Um, I should let you know that this talk is not about convincing you that Python 3 is worth your time and efforts. Uh, if you want to be convinced, uh, I hope my, Python, my PyCon 2013 talk will do that for you. Uh, otherwise, I'm not going to try to point out where Python 3 is necessarily better. So um, if you need convincing, this is not the right talk for you. I assume everyone here has either been convinced or is being forced to be convinced that Python 3 is worth your time. Um, so with that, we'll go on with the show. Um, one of the key things I want people in this room to go away, go away with today is you can start your transition to using Python 3 and writing code that works in 2 and 3 today. I know some of you are going to come and tell me your dependencies are blocking you. That's fine. I understand you can't move heaven and earth to make everyone suddenly switch overnight. If I could, I would have saved everyone problems and done that back in 2008, but that doesn't happen. But that does not mean you can't start changing your code today regardless of your dependencies. So please. If you take away anything, realize that you can go home today and start porting your code without issue. Don't wait for your dependencies. Um, there are some references you can go to after the talk, um, or if you have to dig out early uh, for, to go to another talk or something. Um, Python3porting.com by Leonard Ruzibro. I'm probably butchering his name. I'm sorry, Leonard. Uh, he literally wrote the book on um, porting Python to Python 3. Uh, I disclaimer, I did write the forward for the first edition. Uh, so, but that is a good resource. Uh, the once new documents for all the versions of Python 3 that have been released are also really good references to know exactly what's changed and what's come in, and you can kind of evaluate th how that might affect your Python 2 code. Um, there's also porting how to um, at the URL of a, um, up on the slide. Uh, I'm the author of that slide, um, that how to, and basically this talk is a talk version of that document. So you can also tune me out and read that doc if you'd rather. Um, but there shouldn't be anything in this talk that you can't get from there and vice versa. Um, so to start, one thing you should learn to do is Love6. This is by Benjamin Peterson, one of the core developers. And it's basically a library, and in case you didn't know, it's two times three equals six. Isn't that cute? Um, it's a compatibility library that works from Python 2.5 forward and provides a bunch of little helpers for things that work in two and work in three but are not necessarily a straightforward fix and especially for a couple things that are 2.5 specific. Um, it is a single module, so for any of you that have issues with pulling dependencies down from pip, it's easy to vendor, so you shouldn't have to worry about necessarily going up and grabbing it. So if you have networking problems pulling things out externally, you can stick it directly in your source control. Um, I don't, it's a very liberal license. That I can't remember exactly which one it is. Um, obviously, it's on PyPI. I definitely recommend looking at it, and at worst, you can read through it and see what it covers so you know what potential issues you might have if you decide to port by hand. Uh, but hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll realize porting by hand is no longer ne really necessary that much, and the amount you do by hand should be fairly minimal. Uh, if not, I haven't done my job. Um, I would suggest you only support 2.7. Supporting 2.6 actually is not difficult at all, uh, but Python 2.6.0 came out in 2008, so it's not even supported for bug fixes anymore. So while you can support 2.6 if you choose, I wouldn't bother. You have to work through bugs in the standard library that have subsequently been fixed in Python 2.7. And so if you can make your life simpler by only supporting 2.7, I suggest it. Um, 2.5 and earlier is a real pain in the rear, so I really don't suggest that. And I know rel users will come and say, I can't, la la la. Um, Nick Coughlin promises me that through Red Hat Collections you can get Python 2.7. Uh, talk to him or someone at Red Hat about how to get 2.7. Uh, but basically, try to only do 2.7. 2.6 is okay. But I really would strongly recommend trying to only do Python 2.7. Um, I'm sure almost everyone in this community realizes testing is important. Uh, we always, always have to deal with people going on about, oh, what about static checking and all that stuff. So I'm sure we all know testing is important. Just in case you don't, um, Make sure you have good test coverage. That way you can feel confident that when you do a uh, transition to try to support two and three, uh, you don't accidentally break your own code. Um, nothing here should break anything, but you never know. Uh, obviously coverage.py, which we all know by 
Uh, NED is great for that use, and it's obviously on PyPI. Now, I know a common complaint from people is when you want to support Python 2.3, you typically have a kind of basic uh, template like this for your new files. Uh, the coding line is totally optional. Python 3 supports UTF-8 by default for source encoding, so you can use it now if you want in Python 2 with that little um, comment line. But the future line, obviously, for the import for absolute import, division, print function, Unicode literals, um, is pretty important to try to just get you used to the um, things that have become very common in Python 3. I hear people complain about this all the time, that, oh my god, I have two lines of boilerplate. Two lines? Uh, any of you who've written Java should be laughing right now that we're complaining about two lines of boilerplate. Uh, I think we're all extremely spoiled at, by Python at this point. But I really want to emphasize, it's two lines. So <laughs> the point is, is I know it's a little annoying to have to toss those two lines in every new file, but it's really, really minimal. And I hope people are just going to be OK with it. And hey, once you are only on Python 3, you can delete those lines and they just go away. Um, one of the key things that you can do now that was not originally possible is we have transpilers available in the community that should do all of the easy work for you. So a lot of the stuff like using the as keyword for catching exceptions and such, you don't have to do that manually anymore. Okay, I will cover the tools here and what they are, but basically I don't have to explain to you all the nitty gritty little details of little things you need to change that syntactically might catch you because we have tools to do it for you, right? And you can just run this across your entire tool chain. It'll stay compatible with 2.6 and 2.7. It'll be modernized to be up to snuff for 2.7 isms, and it'll also work in Python 3. So my hope is I will list all the tools you need, and you'll realize that the minimal amount of physical work you have to do is really small, and that these tools will handle all the stupid little details you really don't have to deal with that have held people up in the past, such that it's really, really straightforward to do a port. So one of these transpilers is modernized. Um, it uses the two, the two to three library to actually update your code to modern practices. Um, it's somewhat conservative, uh, but it works fairly well. Uh, I've actually become a contributor to the project, and it will cover all the bases for all the things that you would think a transpiler could do based on syntax and some basic information of things like what's a global and such. It's obviously on PyPI, and you can easily run it across all your code, and it should take care of all the little, little details that you also shouldn't have to worry about. Now, Modernize tries to take a slightly conservative route to make sure things still look a lot like Python 2 code, but still work in 3. If you want a more Python 3 feel while still running under Python 2, uh, there's the Futurize project. Um, you can think of it as Modernize, but with a Python 3 feel. Uh, it actually uses modernize under the hood for some things. And they've done things such as backport the bytes type from Python 3, so you can use them in Python 2 and have it act the exact same way. Some of you might think that's fantastic, some of you might think it's a little too far. It's your call which one you want to use, uh, but they're both there and they both should cover roughly the exact same span of things to handle for you automatically. Uh, once again, it's up on PyPI, and uh, Futurize is actually part of the future project. Now, as I said, those tools should actually get you really far. Um, all that code will run under Python 2.7 without any change whatsoever. Once those tools are done, you won't have to fix anything. It'll just run perfectly fine. They won't necessarily run under Python 3, but you should at least run them under, on, under code even for 2.6.2.7 just to modernize it and bring it up to snuff and common practices. Um, to get all the way to Python 3, you're going to have to do a little bit of work. I'm sorry, we can't automate everything yet. Maybe someday, but there's only so many hours in the day. So probably the biggest thing that everyone gets frustrated with is unfortunately Python 3, well, unfortunately for porting, fortunately, honestly, um, for the way things to work with, uh, you need to care about the difference between text and binary data. Um, you can't conflate the two anymore, and I know some people don't like this, but the idea that you don't know what a string literal is in Python 2, whether it represents binary data or text data, long term isn't really a good thing. I mean, we're, we were honestly one of the only languages that was st still doing this was heavily used on the internet when we decided to do Python 3 and do the separation. So I realize it's annoying to have to do the separation now, but for long term health of projects, 
we have found typically that once projects do it, they love it. You can talk to the Django people about how much they love the fact that we've done the separation now. So I know it requires some work, but we did it for a reason. So don't think this was an arbitrary decision, please. Um, probably the biggest thing you need to do about this new text and binary separation that exists in Python 3 that does not exist in Python 2 is you really need to care about your APIs. One of the side effects of stir being used for bytes and text data is if something took stir in Python 2, it worked for either. Whether it made sense or not is a whole other question. But in Python 3, you can't get away with that because the APIs of bytes and stir in Python 3 do not complete, are not a complete mirror of each other. There's some overlap, but it's not perfect. So you, what you'll have to do in your APIs is make a decision, should this take string, should this take text data, or should this take binary data? And then just do what you have to do to make it work with the proper subset of APIs. Uh, in terms of dealing with that, my strongest suggestion is make sure you mark all your string literals in your code. Uh, once again, as, as I said, in Python 2, you kind of could get away with the string literal could be binary data, it could be text data, but I don't know. Python 3, you're going to have no question what uh, string literal represents. Uh, I personally recommend using the B prefix for binary data and using the future import for Unicode literals, uh, just because that's how Python 3 code looks. Uh, if you don't like that, we did add back support for the U prefix in Python 3.2. I think it's 2. Um, and so you can actually use the U prefix or the B prefix, but my su strong suggestion here is you, for every single string literal, you know exactly what it is. You should have no question. I should be able to come up to you and point to a string literal in your code, and you should be able to tell me, is that binary data or is that text data? Whether you do it with the prefixes or use the future import, it's up to you and your personal internal practices. Um, and I'll mention some tooling later that should help you enforce this if this is what you decide to do. Um, as I said, you're going to have to update your APIs. Um, if it's going to work with text, basically make sure it's going to work with the Unicode type from Python 2, because that's basically what STIR is in Python 3. If it's working with binary data, um, it's going to work with a subset of the STIR type. Um, one of the things you're really going to have to watch out for is indexing on bytes. In Python 3, when you index on bytes, it returns an integer. And in Python 2, it's obviously going to return a s single length uh, STIR instance. Um, I'm going to mention something about Python 3 in a few slides that will help a lot with this. But this is something to be aware of. Um, this will catch you if you do like comparison of equals to like b and then some single character um, bytes literal. So it is definitely something to watch out for. I know this bit has bitten me, but as I said, Python 3.5 will have something to help with this. Um, but otherwise, be very strict about what you accept. Either accept binary data, accept text data, but don't try to accept both. It gets really confusing really fast. It's easier just to be very separate. Um, and 6 will also help you with all this. Now, in terms of where you're going to have to make a clear separation of the two and worry about overlap, uh, these are the unique methods on the sir type versus bytes uh, in Python 3. So uh, bytes has decode, but stir does not. Um, and then stir has the uh, dunder mod, which is modulo. Uh, that's on italics because I'm going to talk about something in Python 3.5 in a moment about that. It also has encode, format, is decimal, and is numeric. So those are all unique to stir um, in Python 3. So in Python 2, if you're dealing with binary data, you can't use those. That's basically it. And if you're working with bytes, you can't decode, which makes sense. Otherwise, all those other, um, like make trans and all those other methods actually overlap, so you're safe to use those in Python 2 and have them work in Python 3. Now, uh, one of the things we've done with Python 3.5 is made a couple of improvements to uh, actually make working with binary data a little easier. So we've gone back and added back in uh, bytes interpolation. So you can use the module operator as you can see here. Uh, so if you've been using that to deal with your um, binary data for STIR, you'll, that'll work in Python 3. Uh, percent %s basically becomes uh, uh, synonymous with percent %b, which we're adding in Python 3. But basically, all that string work you do with that will fall through. We didn't add um, the format method to bytes, though. We consider that a very string-specific way to actually do your string interpolation. Uh, but that is there. Uh, the other thing that got added in Python 3 is if you use dash b, uh, you'll get a warning when you compare ints to bytes. So if you remember a couple slides ago, I said 
when you index on bytes in Python 3, you get back an int. And that's really watch out for those comparisons against like single, um, single character um, byte literals. This will help you find those because basically you'll get a Py3, you'll get a warning, a bytes warning saying, hey, you're trying to compare an int to a byte. That's probably a screw up and not something you mean to do. So this will throw up a nice warning. If you do dash BB, it'll actually be an exception and that'll help you catch those cases as well. Now I should say, I don't know how many more things we might add back to help with porting. So don't think, oh, well maybe this one thing I need is gonna be in Python 3.6. I wouldn't, work, I wouldn't think that way. I suspect 3.5, um, based on some comments on Python dev, is going to be one of the last releases where we try to really backport stuff. This um, bytes interpolation was one of the last things that people really, really wanted that I know of. Um, and this uh, dash B was one of the last things I know of that could trip people up without getting some kind of either tooling to auto handle for you or throw some warning or exception in your face to make it easy to debug when you run under Python 2 or 3. So this should honestly cover all the cases, so I wouldn't expect much change that going forward in 3.6. So in other words, don't wait for another release. If you do decide to wait for 3.5, that's fine for these, but I wouldn't wait past that. Uh, the other thing we can't automate for you is division. Uh, division should not be a surprise. This has actually been coming since Python 2.2, uh, which is, uh, I believe it was released in 2002 or three. So, yeah, you've had over a decade for this, so I'm hoping no one's shocked by this. Um, I understand if you haven't just bothered to put the future statement in, but um, basically it can't be automated because there's a chance you might be using an object in Python 2 that uses dunder div for the way to handle the division operator and not dunder true div. Um, if you know for a fact you're not using any code that has an overloaded dunder div operation, there are ways to like modernize to use optional fixers to automatically translate all your divisions to what you would expect. Uh, but it, this is the reason you actually have to be a little careful. As I said, in Python 2, when you do division, in case you don't know, uh, we automatically floor it to the nearest integer, but we actually return a float in Python 3, basically like most sane people other than programmers would expect division to do. Um, use the future statement, another way you can actually do this is in Python 2, there's a dash capital Q flag, which will actually automatically turn on the division warnings or turn them into errors. So you can actually automatically apply it across your code without the future statement. Uh, but as I said, uh, we can't blindly automate this just because you never know about what, what objects you might be using. Now, once you've done all this work, you probably don't want to accidentally undo all your hard work. Uh, so PyLints recently gained a dash dash PyK3 flag that will run a bunch of checks against your code to actually make sure that you're not doing anything in your Python 2 code that will not work in Python 3. Uh, the dash dash py, py 3 k flag will only run Python 3 checks. So if you, for instance, don't like running PyLint because you're worried about false positives in your code and such, this flag will turn off all other checks. So this should be very clear and very safe to run on your code and you shouldn't have to worry about false positives or any other issues. So I strongly recommend you do this. Um, disclaimer, I did write this code for all this, so I might, hopefully it's good and does what you need, but um, I do recommend you use this to help make sure you don't regress. Um, as I've mentioned, um, there's dash B in uh, Python 3, which is a no-op in Python 2 to warn you about byte interactions, such as comparing a byte to an int and some other things. Uh, under Python 2, there's the dash 3 flag, which will actually trigger various warnings. Um, about stuff that you might want to worry about, and then you can use dash W to actually force them into warnings to get exceptions instead of a warning. So, if you've done all this, your code should hopefully run in Python 3, assuming your dependencies are important, obviously. But this should be it, right? So, you should be able to run modernize or futurize on your code. You should have to worry about your text and binary data APIs and get those fixed. Um, you'll have to worry about division and then use PyLint to make sure you don't regress and maybe potentially pick up some things that modernize or futurize didn't do, but that's it, okay? That should be all you have to do to get here. You shouldn't have to worry about little details and all this other stuff. You should be able to actually do all this and this should get you to Python 3 and be complete backwards compatible with Python 2. So, as I said, hopefully tooling will handle most of it. Now, we all have to deal with those pesky dependencies, which I know rely on others can be, frustrating, but gotta do it, I understand. So, 
There are a couple ways to help you deal with this. Um, I have a project I created called Can I Use Python 3, which will check which of your dependencies are on Python 3. Uh, there's an API with test for test integration that will actually stay true as long as you have a blocker, so that basically you'll have a failing test when all your dependencies have been ported. Uh, it can take in pip requirements files and package dash info files and a couple other things. Um, but this way you always will have something in your continuous integration to let you know the instant all your dependencies are no longer blocking you. Um, uh, Lannish Idle also has a nice website, caniusepython3.com, which runs this code, um, which will let you very easily with a web front end run this code and you can actually upload your comments.txt file and all that stuff and it'll do all the checks for you. So you can very easily check every so often if you don't want to have this part of your test integration um, and it'll actually have a little badge too you can get to actually visibly see it. Um, and it's on PyPI, so you can always grab that. Uh, obviously, sometimes you might have to figure out how to get your dependencies ported. You can always ask. Sometimes people honestly just don't know that they have Python 3 users that want them to switch and that they're blocking them. Uh, you can do it yourself, as I've, as I've hopefully explained. You can run a lot of tooling to get, a lot of, get pretty far in a lot of things. So you could honestly grab one of them, run the tools on it, and just see if it worked. Um, or you can always hire someone to do it for you. Um, I know some of you probably depend on some extensions. Um, my recommendation, honestly, is to write them to use CFFI or Cython or even C types. Don't hand roll, if you, hand roll your own C extensions if you can help it. Uh, you might be surprised, honestly, at how fast uh, these things can handle uh, interfacing with uh, C code. Like if you had a really, really tight C loop, uh, for loop that you had to do in C, you still could expose it through CFFI and probably get really good performance. So I would definitely look at doing this because this will handle the porting for you. Um, but that should be what is required for you to get to Python 3. As I've said, lots of tools to help you do it, to take care of a lot of the details. The API stuff is why we get paid to use our brains, so it happens, I'm sorry. But once you get that straightened out, honestly, you should have all the tooling you need to automate most of it, to make sure you don't break it until you can run Python 3, and then once you're on Python 3, because we have tools now to tell you when you can run Python 3, we can welcome you to the latest version of Python. Um, as I said earlier, a key thing with Python 3 is using dash b once you're on Python 3 to help catch little regressions you might have in your Python 2 code because you're probably going to be straddling it for a little while. Um, and as I also mentioned earlier with the continuous integration, once you're on Python 3, you can use pylinks dash dash py3k to prevent regressions. Um, and obviously Tox is a very good tool to run under multiple versions of Python because hopefully once you can use Python 3, you'll be running your tests against Python 2.7 and 3. Point whatever you decide to support. Uh, so Tox is good for that. And that is it. Uh, so questions? If you didn't hear Chris, there's a microphone right in front of me. Feel free to line up and I will attempt to answer your questions. Hi. So Hi. the thing that made me sort of give up on Python 3 porting was a module that used a, um, it heavily used gitadder. And so, you know, that's a native string. It's stir on Python 2 and 3. Mm -hmm. And so because it was originally written for Python 2, it was also sending these strings over the network. So okay. it had sort of this implicit dependency that this was bytes. And now on Python 3, I have to go through basically every string literal in both the implementation and the tests and determine is this supposed to be an identifier or not. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this is something that I'd looked at like uh, tooling for before, but it doesn't seem like this is really something you can automate very well. Yeah, this is exactly why in Python 3 we decided to do the separation, right? Where it's like not really clear that, okay, this is going to be used as an identifier and that it's not really bytes, it's actually a representative string of something that you could use. Like in Python 3, it could very easily be UTF-8, which you have to be able to support as a string. But bytes makes no sense because you're not gonna care about uh, slash zero, right? The, there's gonna be no null bytes there ever and it makes no sense. So yeah, it's one of, the, uh, this, is, this is the whole text versus binary data that you just can't really get too much tooling for. Now, there is a lot of talk about um, adding type hints and such into Python, which Guido will talk about when he gives his keynote. Um, there's a possibility that could help in some instances, perhaps, by helping 
uh, flow through the types and detect that this is always going to be text, this is always going to be binary data, and then help figure that out. But yeah, that, this is going to be one of those situations where unfortunately tooling can only get you so far and you're just going to have to do the manual work for the rest of the way. I suspect if you're using like the global get adder, you might be able, for instance, to over, override that globally uh, in built-ins and then detect where it's being called and then see, oh, that's that string, and then find that string in your source code and know that's always going to be Unicode, not bytes. And then build, there, I mean, there should be ways to instrument if you're using get adder directly to detect what its arguments are and find those in your source code. Yeah, that would help. Um, but so with regard to the type hints, though, I mean, not to get too far off onto that, but mm -hmm. I mean, this would be something that, you know, if Python 2 compatibility is going to ma be a thing for, you know, years in the future that this is the, like, you know, native string type that's stir in both is going to have to be like a type unto itself pretty much because it's, I, I mean, there are things like identifiers and other, other places in the Python standard library where like you, I, yeah. I mean, on Python 2, you can't pass Unicode, and on Python 3, you can't pass bytes. Yeah, I know. It's one of those weird situations with the native string type. And if people don't know what I mean by native string, it's basically if you have a string literal that has no marker on it whatsoever, and you're not using the from future import Unicode literal, it's the str type in Python 2, and it's the str type in Python 3. But you have to realize that the str type in Python 2 is its own thing, and the str type in Python 3 is its own thing. Um, so that's definitely one of those instances where you have to be very aware of um, the overlap. And this is one of the reasons, like, the, only, it only ex the native string type only exists because the u prefix was brought back into Python 3. So, I mean, th once again, you can be very careful with that and be very, uh, be very careful with your u prefix and your b prefix and still have the native fall through. It's just, you're going to just have to be careful and just be very aware of what your code is meant to do and what it's doing and just care for it that way. All right, thank you. Hi. So I uh, maintain a scientific library with a... C Python extension that's 4,927 lines. Mm -hmm. And so do you really think that I need to switch over to the other approaches for? Whereas the extension, you don't have to. It's just various people have found it easier that if they switch to CFFI and or Cython or C types, it moves forward. You don't have to at all. So for instance, coverage.py has a C extension for speed, and that works in, Python, in both Python 2 and Python 3. There's actually a how-to on docs.python.org on how to handle C extensions that are both Python 2 and Python 3. So there are definitely ways to do it, and you can do it with various macros and just being careful about certain things. I mean, it's I, just, I, I'm, if I'm, you can handle it, it's obviously easier because they'll handle all that, all those low-level details that you've been dealing with on your own for you, but no, it's definitely not necessary. Yeah, I'm open-minded, but it just, there are so many things to do in the world, so. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Just, it's not really a question, but a little advertising pitch. Sure. I, um, I don't know if you've seen Brett, but I wrote um, for O'Reilly a little white paper called From Future Import Python, which okay. they're giving away for free down in the booth downstairs, and it covers mo much of the same material that Brett did. Um, not nearly as much detail as the resources he points to, but um, it's an introduction to it. Okay, so there you go, guys. O'Reilly's booth has a free little white paper by David Mertz. Uh, that'll also talk about this. If you want some paper form of some of the stuff I covered, feel free to go grab a dead tree downstairs and take it home. Uh, well, we're out of questions, and we're actually out of time as well. So uh, please thank Brett Cannon for his fantastic talk. Thank you, everyone, for coming. <laughs>